What do you say? We are in a series, as you know, I've just said it, on what happens when we live by the Spirit, is what it's called. And we're going through this section in uh, a letter called Galatians, when he talks about, the writer talks about living or uh, producing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're talking about today. So to get started, I've had people in my life recently tell me, people who love me, uh, Ross, you're not fun anymore. Ouch! It hurts. You know, they may not have said it just like that. They, they probably said something more like, you're just always so serious. Like, what happened? Um, it's kind of unfair, but also true and fair in a minute. But has anybody said that to you? I know we have folks in, in recovery in our community. Has anyone ever said to you, or I liked you better when you were drinking? Or anybody who's had that experience? Caleb's shaking his head. Since he, he he's, was willing to say that, he's like, no, nobody said that to me. <laughs> They may not have said it. They may have been thinking it. Um, that, that happened to me. People, they knew me in one sort of era of my life. And, and then over the last 10 years, we'll talk about why 10 years later, people said, you're so serious. You're not light. You're not fun anymore. Oh, that's, that's hard to hear. Here's what's unfair about that. Sometimes when people are saying that to you or they're saying it to somebody else, what they don't know is a lot of what was fun you was fake you. What was fun about you was a false self you. There were things that you did to like to numb your pain. As we talked about last week, to have fun and forget things. And other people experienced that as like the fun you, but it was the fake you. Um, it, it, it wasn't your true self, you know, rooted in Christ. That's the unfair part of it. Here's the fair part of it for me. I have struggled. It, this is strange to say. Ten years ago, I really went all in with Jesus. In 2011, I should have put a picture of the parking spot where it happened. Parking spot in Nashville, Tennessee. I took a picture this summer of that spot. I went back to it, sat in it. And it was there in a car when I was having a nervous breakdown where I met Jesus. Like, I felt like face to face. I felt, I heard his voice in my ear calling me to go all the way in. And it was from that day forward, my joy got a lot deeper and my struggle for joy really began. I have struggled with joy uh, a lot in the last 10 years. What about you? Do you struggle with joy? I don't mean like, like you're, you're happy, you got a smile on your face. I'm, when I'm thinking of joy, this is not like a dictionary definition or a theology dissertation on joy. It's like something you feel deep down in your soul, like, like a chord, there's something resonating in you, where you feel, you feel good, you feel happy in your soul. Do you struggle with joy to have that, to experience that? How many people do? Come on, let's be, let's be fair. Do you struggle with joy? Maybe we need to hear from the people who don't. Maybe you need to come up here and talk about it. We'll have a section for you in a minute because I'm going to ask you a question. I have struggled with joy a lot over the last 10 years, and, and we're going to talk about that fruit of the Spirit. What happened was, though, um, I told you, I want to read these words to you uh, that saved my life. In the, in the middle of a nervous breakdown, I started like digging into scriptures in the morning because I had to. I was having panic attacks for the first time in my life. I was depressed for the first time in my life. I was having an identity crisis. And I read uh, these words right here. And these are the words that Jesus whispered to me as I sobbed in a car in a parking lot. Ross, I've heard that story. I'm tired of hearing it. Tough. It's my salvation story. I'm going to tell it until I'm dead. Uh, as you should tell your story until you are dead. It is the story of Jesus. Keep telling it to anyone who will hear. 
Jesus says in John 15, so this is the Gospel of John. There are four accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is what's called the Gospel of John, or the good news according to John. Good news was a word they used at that time when an heir of the emperor of Rome was born. So the people who wrote these accounts about Jesus' life were saying, that's not good news when an heir of the emperor is born. This Jesus person is good news for us and for the world. In John 15, this is called the farewell discourse. It's, it's Jesus' last speech to his followers. It's his parting words to them. This is part of it. He says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And my father is the vineyard keeper. Can you see that imagery? God the father is vineyard keeper. And in this vast, beautiful, majestic vineyard, there's this true vine from which all things get life, new life. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the vineyard keeper. He removes any branches that don't produce fruit. And he trims or prunes any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus talks like the minute that I speak to you has a way, if you have ears to hear, of pruning off the branches that are keeping light from getting into your system, my light. Remain in me or abide in me and I will abide in you. A branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain or abide in the vine. Likewise, you, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. Those branches are gathered up, thrown into a fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified when you produce much fruit and this way prove that you are my disciples. Hear it again, my father is glorified when you produce much fruit and in this way prove that you are my disciples. But I thought if I just prayed the sinner's prayer, I was Jesus' disciple. Nope. If you abide in him and produce the fruit that Jesus produces, you're going to show people this. I'm, the, I'm a disciple of his. As the Father loved me, I too have loved you. Do you hear that? Jesus is saying, I'm only producing fruit in my life out of my connection with my Father. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and remain in his love. Here it is. I have said these things to you. I think Josh is trying to get it back up on the screen. There it is. This is where we, we had to read all those verses to get the context for this. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Do you hear that? That is a wild verse. I not see some of you are like look like you're already like it's nap time. I want you to take a big breath in, and when you breathe out, breathe out all the things that you're thinking right now, your, your work, the stress, the worry, whatever. Breathe that in and breathe in Jesus, breathe in joy, breathe out the things that are clouding your mind right now. Be present here and hear these words. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you. And your joy will be complete. 
That's wild. Jesus is saying to you and me, if you abide in me, it's not like it might happen, it might not. If you're abiding in me, my joy, the joy that flows from the Father into me, into my system, is going to flow into your system. And you're going to grow in this complete joy. It's going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Here's the problem with that. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. In the last 10 years, I heard these verses. This chapter has haunted me for 10 years in a beautiful and difficult way. These words have haunted me. That day in the parking lot, I felt like this. I took this, sorry, this is going to be a bit dark. I took this off of a casket of a graveside funeral that I did. That one, Jason. Jason gave me a call and asked me to help out on something once. I took it off of that because I felt like this that day. Like I had been, I was disconnected and I wanted to remember that. And I keep staring at this to say, like, there's this myth we think of. We might easily take from these branch, from these verses. We may think that God is in the business of going around and saying, okay, I, I like the way Christy's been living. Christy, blessings. I, Dave has been doing a good job. Blessings, Dave. Shay, ooh, I like the way Shay's been being faithful. Blessings, Shay. God is in the business of going around watching people's behavior, seeing if they're holy or righteous or not, and then going, hey, ble blessings. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is a fact of, it's, it's just a fact of nature. So like, if I had like my dad go outside right now and yank hard on a branch of a tree and pull it off, My dad would not be choosing whether to make that branch not fruitful anymore. By nature of that branch being disconnected from the tree, it's going to slowly and slowly wither. God does not delight in watching people wither. Do you hear that? God is, is grieved. When the human beings that God created in love for love, God is grieved to look on human beings and see them withering. When in fact, they could be connected into the source of life, Jesus, and flourishing. God, like, man, there's in this history in Christianity that whether we meant to or not, we, we made God out to be this wrathful God who's, who's almost a little excited Oh, I'm finally going to get revenge on these people who aren't doing what I want them to do. No, God is grieving to see this like plant that's made to be connected into life, flourishing, producing fruit. It's just a fact of matter. Like when we are plugged into Jesus, spiritually doing intentional things to spend our lives with Jesus, when you're doing this here, praise God. When you're doing this, that's a way for you to connect into the vine, Jesus. You, you, you chose to be here today. You could have been other places. You chose to be here. And in so doing, you're abiding in the vine. When you choose to pray, even when you feel, feel foolish praying, like, I don't think I'm a very good prayer. Every time you choose to pray, you're abiding in the vine. Every time you wrestle with this Bible, which is so hard to understand, amen? The more I know about this, the more I know I don't know about it. But every time I show up and say, God, help me to understand, I'm abiding in the vine. Every time we connect in, we are going, the Holy Spirit is going to flow into our veins. Every time you go out and serve, Yesterday, there were a group of us who went into Indianapolis with Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And we, we went out serving. Um, we installed bunk beds in families who had signed up because they needed beds for their kids. 
we were connected into the vine. I'm going to tell you, I felt a joy deep down in my soul from that. Fruit. You know, every time we serve, anytime you see somebody as a masterpiece out in the world, you greet somebody and see Jesus in them. You, that is, you're abiding in the vine. You're producing fruit. Every time you intentionally plug into the vine with your life, you're abiding. And Jesus says, just like a branch that is well-connected can't help but produce fruit. It's like the mulberry tree I found in my backyard recently. Some of you saw it on Facebook. My kids came in with their hands stained and their shoes stained, tracking it into my house, tracking in the fruit of this tree into my house. And I was like, what is this? What is this from? I go outside and there are these berries. I don't know what they are. I've lived in this house for three summers now. We miss the good stuff happening in our backyard. I said, Dad, I called the amateur uh, tree expert in my midst. Dad, what is this? It's a mulberry, son. No, I said, Dad, I, well, I know what mulberry leaves look like. He said, apparently you don't. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he did not say that. Jesus says a tree will undeniably be known by its fruit. Whatever I thought that tree was, undeniably it was a mulberry tree because the fruit that dropped into my grass, stained my children's hands, and tracked into my house, that is what your life is supposed to be. Your hands stained with the fruit of Jesus, tracking it into every house where you walk, every place where you live. People going, what is on your hands? I can't help it. I'm a branch in the vine. It's what I do. That's the good news. If you're plugged in, you're going to grow in this fruit. It's going to happen. But you got to make the choice to plug in. You got to ask yourself, am I half in, half out? I'm going to do some Jesus hobby work. I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian by hobby. It's one of my hobbies. I also like knitting. I do Jesus and knitting. Jesus is in a hobby. He is your life. We don't exist but by the grace of God. We don't have new life but by the grace of God shown to us in Jesus. Are you plugged all the way in? In 2011, I came to the hard realization I was not. I was trying to grow in my ambition and achievement game. I was going to climb two ladders at once. My first ever sermon I preached was on. So I was trying to climb, climb the social ladder like, man, I'm going to be Dr. Stackhouse. Cocktail parties, people are like, I want to go talk to that guy because he knows everything. Like such an egotistical pursuit. Jesus, I'm going to dabble in you a little bit and then climb this ladder over here too. And Jesus came to me in my nervous breakdown where I was withering. When you're withering, it's an invitation, not an end. And he was like, hey, it's time to plug all the way in. Will you do it? And I've been doing it ever since. And I've been struggling with joy ever since. This is where we're going to spend the last few minutes of the sermon. All the things I just said. The beautiful goodness of Jesus I've experienced by being in the vine, my joy is so much deeper. My love just keeps, my, my knowledge of God just keeps growing and growing and growing. But I also keep getting so darn frustrated. It's like my life gets more fruitful and more frustrating at the same time. Anybody relate to that? I'm it. I'm the only one. Well, okay, I'll keep talking. Maybe you're with me. Um, so here's what I want to talk about the stroke. I'm going to tell you a bit about this is the practical section of the sermon. This is where we're going to spend the last few minutes. I've heard so many sermons on joy. I've preached to myself where somebody talked about the struggle for joy as I have done. And then we went into this philosophical discussion about joy as if that helps a person. I want to give you some practical things that will sound philosophical at first, and then we're going to talk like some things I've been thinking about recently. First of all, 
Here's how our joy in Christ grows, I think. Here's what I've been thinking about this week. I hope it helps you. Because maybe you're like me. Maybe you're doing this thing. Like, you were like this. Maybe your step today is like, I'm like this, and it's time for me to plug all the way in. If you're there, come talk to me. My whole life is dedicated to helping you go from this to plugging into the vine. Maybe that's your step today. That's the only thing you're going to take away. Maybe you feel like you're trying to abide, but you're like me. You're struggling for joy. You don't feel like there's much of it. You're like me. People are going, man, you used to be kind of lighthearted. Now you're just so heavy and hard all the time. Our joy is first based on this. I'm going to give you three things that I think our joy is based on that we're going to grow in. Number one, if we're abiding in a vine, our joy is built on nothing less than this. Christ has saved us. And you're like, oh man, you just gave me like Baptist speak for joy and it did nothing for me. Stay with me. What I've been learning the last 10 years, I keep growing in this, like I start to realize what it means when that verse says, for God so loved the world. And then it says, he came to save the world, not condemn it. Man, I am growing in that. This branch is growing in knowledge of that. I'm growing in a bit of confusion with it too. But man, some days when I'm really down, when things are really getting to me, sometimes, sometimes by grace, I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, Christ has died and he is risen, which means that every sin that I've ever done is crushed, forgiven, death, crushed, evil, crushed. I will be restored. This whole earth will be restored. I rejoice. That is your foundation for joy in any season. You can stand on that. doesn't matter how hard things are. This reality remains. Christ was crucified. He is risen. He will come again. He is restoring you. He is restoring the entire world. And he will win. Love will win. Amen? Amen. You can stand on that joy every morning if you choose to. Caleb was talking about this one night in one of our meetings. We were all being Debbie Downers. Who is Debbie, by the way? She got a bad rap. Bad rap. Anyways, we were all being Debbie Downers about the weather. Because it was raining, and, and Caleb comes to us, and he's like, you know what? I just, what did you say, Caleb? Can you remind me? Caleb showed us how intentionally, like, he steps into the, to the fog, to the clouds, and he says, you know what? This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Like, we can, we can choose to abide. We may not be able to choose how we feel. Sometimes that's a chemical thing going on up here. But we can choose that spiritual reality. Here's the practical piece that I want to leave you with today that I think is super practical. That I, that's our joy. That's the foundation of our joy, what I just said. Everything else is commentary on that. All right, you with me? Here's where we close. Here's the truth about me. We can go in one of two extremes if we're struggling with joy, I think. I'm going to tell you the extreme I went to, and I'm trying to make my way back out of it. Christ has saved us, so we confront heavy and hard realities with him. If we follow Jesus and just retreat into our safe space and never confront heavy and hard things with him, we're not doing our jobs as his disciples. We are supposed to be people who walk alongside hurting people. We are supposed to contend with injustice in our time, like racial injustice. In our times, like social issues, we are supposed to walk alongside suffering brothers and sisters. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Whatever that something is in Christ, our joy is in that. There is no greater joy sometimes than being aligned with Jesus on the mission. I felt that yesterday when we were serving with Sleep in Heavenly Peace. I was like, man, I've got the joy of alignment right now. Walking into this home where these, this family is experience, ser, experiencing serious poverty, 
and setting up this bed here with some brothers and sisters, man, we're confronting heavy and hard things together and there is joy from it. We're supposed to be doing that and it will give us joy. Here's the problem. I started to weight everything on that. My wife will be talking to me some days and I'm so in my head confronting heavy and hard realities all the time. I've got no space for lightness. I'm, I'm as heavy as, I mean, a huge boulder most of the times because all the time in my head, I'm like, news article, heavy issue. Oh, what am I supposed to do about it? Next news article, what am I, Twitter feed. Oh man, that's another one. I better do something about that. Better think through what I think is the right thing to think. What, honey? Sorry, I'm doing, I'm heavy and hard right now. I never have space for this Sabbath where I put up a boundary like no heavy and hard stuff gets in. It's time to play. It's time to have fun. Do you have that in your life? Do you have intentional spaces where no heavy and hard realities are allowed into your life or into your mind? Your only goal is to have fun with people. Joy, because when we do that, we're actually glimpsing heaven. Heaven is like that. Do you have that space in your life? And if somebody comes to you with a heavy, hard philosophical question, you can totally say, not today. No phone, I'm putting it away. Do you have space where you're just, you're just having fun? That's it. Would anybody be willing to share, maybe you're like me, you have, you have like next to none of that. Let's, let's segue. Thank you, sister. We're a good team. Maybe you're on the other extreme. Sometimes, because this world is so heavy and hard, maybe because of something that's happened to you, maybe something you're going through, you go into the other extreme. It's just every time, it's time for fun and good times. You never confront any heavy and hard realities. You're not doing it often. Every time is playtime. For some people, that goes so far into the extreme that they're using substances because they don't want to confront the heavy and hard realities that have happened to them that are happening in the world. So you're partying all the time. Everything should be fun. Like, honestly... Sometimes, like, people might not show up to do, like, spiritual things because it's like, it's not fun. I don't want to do that. I don't want to pray. Praying's not fun. I want to read the Bible. The Bible's not fun. Well, following Jesus isn't always fun, okay? So, our joy is in both things, and it's a rhythm. That, that's the practical piece. That's what I hope one of the things you do. One, take away that our foundation is built on nothing less that Christ has saved us and is saving the world. As Paul says, nothing stands between us but love now. Nothing can defeat us. But maybe go with this balance, this rhythm that we're all trying to live into, which is do you have space in your life where you're having, you're having fun? Maybe not too much fun. Doesn't mean it's just like, do whatever you want. But you know, it's a good times with good people whom you love, friends, family. Enjoying what God has given you. Enjoying what God has given you. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have space for that? Then, do you have times when you're intentionally like, you're confronting heavy and hard things. When you're not doing that, the word for that is escape. Is your life filled with escape? Or, or is it like a rhythm of having jo joyful good times, having fun and 
doing some hard things with Christ. Our joy is in both. It's a rhythm. It's a balance I'm continuing to learn. And right now, I'm trying to practice this thing where it's like, I just need to have some fun today. And there's a voice in my head that's like, no fun! Maybe the voice in your head is like, I don't want to do that. That's kind of like, I don't want to confront that. Could it be like, I don't even want to ask God for forgiveness for that. I'd rather just do something else. I don't want to go serve, man. That's not fun. I don't want to read my Bible. That's not fun. I don't want to come on Sundays. That's not fun. Well, I hope Sundays are a little bit fun. I hope they're a lot of fun, actually. I hope we laugh at a good time together. But I'll read this one more time and close. Uh, just This is it. Breathe in. Take a big, deep breath in. Breathe out. Maybe do it again. I have said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Hear it again. I have said these things so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. This is my commandment, love each other just as I have loved you. That's the law right there according to Jesus. I've said these things to you Ross, not so that you're so heavy all the time. I'm not asking you to be heavy all the time. Dave, I'm not asking you to be heavy all the time. Also, you can't have fun all the time. I've said these things to you, so my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. Let's pray. God, help us to abide in you. Teach us what that looks like practically in our lives. Show us how to do that. Help us to grow in the knowledge of what you have done in the cross and resurrection. Increase in us the knowledge and joy of that. And may we track that all over into the world, the joy of that. Help us to, to have space in our lives for fun, for enjoyment of the things you've given us, to taste and see heaven in those times. And also, show us the things you call us to confront in ourselves and in the world, in our situation and in our community and society, so that, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.